Today, this is the future of group hub design. And starting at the left, I have Tim Lai, Tim Lai, architect, Wall Keys of Land Grant Brewing, and then Jared Sean of Hoof Hearted. So we have beer and architecture all represented down the line. Um, and also for this talk, I just like to thank Hoof Hearted and Land Grant because they have provided beer. So there's going to be a tasting reception. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. I don't think the language matters, but there will be beer and it will be after the talk in the hall. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd also like to thank the Steam Factory and Ohio State for providing the space because this is theirs and we are here. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all the introduction stuff for now. Uh, I guess to get started, one thing is, you know, what is a brew pub? And if you consult the, I'm not going to actually read from this, Oxford Companion of Beer. All it says is, the brew pub is a modern business model for the ancient practical concept, serving and selling beer on the premises where it is brewed. That's it. You don't need food, you don't need anything else. <laughs> but one thing to keep in mind, and maybe, um, well, I'll start, I'll start with you. Okay. Or Jared, you know, everybody can pitch in. Sure. There's obviously the production of beer, and there's also the consumption of beer. Sometimes you start production only. Sometimes, you know, you guys in particular started as both. Yeah having your own sort of tap room on site. Can you talk about maybe the decisions that went into, you know, doing both at the same time versus maybe just doing production? You know, what are the, yeah. what sort of, you know, brought you to that, you know? Yeah, and I mean, yeah, place? so, you know, brewing and, um, you know, you know, beer production is a, is a interesting in industry in that, you know, there's a dozen different ways to do it. I mean, you can do a nano brewery where you're basically brewing on a homebrew setup in some very small quantities, you can do, um, you know, a brew pub where you're a full-scale restaurant. You can do, you know, strictly production where you don't even have a public-facing space. Um, and you can be successful, you know, doing it any of those ways. Um, so when we were, when we were starting out, uh, we made the decision pretty early on that um, we wanted to be a production-sized brewery. Um, but we also wanted to have that public-facing space um, in a in a location um, close to the central, you know, close to the urban core, um, that you know people can come and, and talk to the brewer and and hear our story from us, because um, you know you look at the history of, of breweries, you know, both in America and around the world, and, and they really kind of um, served as that sort of uh, community gathering place. That, you know, every town had a brewery pretty much, and you'd go down there and get beer. Um, you know, maybe you know sit and have a, a pint, or maybe you take it to go, whatever it is. Uh, we wanted to be accessible in that way, but at the same time, we wanted to um, brew a lot of beer on a, on a high um, high level of quality. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of early decision to, to go with that business model really drove everything else we did. Um, and because of that, it took us a while to find a space and to get open yeah. and all that stuff. Well, Jared, you guys didn't do that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we went the, kind of the other direction. Um, not not uh, because we didn't want to. Um, when we first started, we uh, we had a similar vision uh, of what we wanted to try to do, um, and uh, we got limited by some financial um, limitations and that type of thing. So, um, but similarly to what Walt said, we we wanted to produce. I mean, we had basically our mission statement was two things: we wanted to make the best beer that we possibly could, and we wanted to make it fun. Which, for people that you know say our name it either they <laughs> giggle or what have you but that was um that was really what we were saying how do you how do you pronounce it hoof hearted <laughs> very distinct um everybody knows so yeah um how do you come with that name i'm kind of curious um <laughs> we uh it, is there some incident in well, yeah, it's actually, there was, a, there was a racehorse back in the 70s, um, and it was kind of a joke that we had used when we were growing, Trevor and I grew up together, and uh, we always giggled at it, and it was just kind of funny, and um, we had been kind of traveling around and going to breweries all over the place, um, had been big beer fans for quite some time, and it just kind of came upon us one day. I think Trevor said, hey, why don't, you know, why don't we start a brewery called Hoof Hearted, and I was like, all right. Uh, so, um, you know, and then after it, you know, it's kind of went from there. Yeah. So, Tim, I know that you're involved with Hoof Hearted because you're doing the restaurant where they're going to have a production facility in it. Can you talk about 
how do you get away with that? Like, what is the, yes. there's supposedly a wall between these things, and yes. you guys are So, so this, right. this, is yeah. one of, this is one of the things that's is kind of a, a little bit of a complicated, it's a little bit hard to explain. So when you deal with brewery um, and a pop situation, um, there is, there's two issues, there's two separate issues. One is on the zoning side, and the other is on the building code side. On the zoning side, a brewery facility is, is basically a categorized as a um, manufacturing use. In a manufacturing use, uh, from a zoning standpoint, cannot be in a commercial uh, use space. Meaning that, like, for example, if you go up High Street, basically all the, all the property along High Street is commercial use, mostly C4, we call it, except in downtown, which is its own land use. And so you cannot really brew beers if you are in those commercial zones unless you only consume those beer on premise. So it's very complicated. So that's on the that's on the zoning side. On the on the uh, the building code side, which deal with this building safety inside a building, um, brewery is is categorized as a, a factory use. It's just like it's slightly different. I mean, it's basically the same thing, but it's a factory use. It's F one basically. Sometimes I have two, I think. So it depends on how how how, uh, how dangerous that that, that uh, operation is, I guess. Um, if you're brewing something higher uh, alcohol content, it's it's one category versus the other one. So um, so on that side, because I know the land grant. If you've been to land grant, yeah, uh, their facility, they have a glass between the brew pub and the uh, facility that you don't notice it. It's a glass, but it's a super thick glass. <laughs> I suppose it's, it, it can within two hours of a fire rating. It's a very uh, expensive It's one. very expensive <laughs> one. And that's because they need to uh, uh, maintain a certain separation between one part of the building and the other part of the building. Now, now that is partly because they don't have a sprinkler system, mm -hmm. I assume. So when you don't have an automatic sprinkler system, like here, you can see we have a sprinkler system, but some of the older buildings don't have a sprinkler system, and they therefore they would need to provide a more uh, a high rating for that separation. Um, and sometimes, for example, in our case, we are doing a, a, a microbrewery in a restaurant in Italian Fish for Hufada. It's called Hufada Brewery and Kitchen. Um, and that one, we don't actually have to provide any separation. And part of the reason is because within the building code, there's also a provision called non separated mixed occupancy. It's very complicated. But basically, what that means is if the overall space can accommodate the most restrictive use, then you don't have to provide the separation except if there is residential components of which we don't, obviously. So again, it's very complicated, obviously. but that's Fortunately. kind of, in a nutshell, that, that's what happened. So, that's why you need a high architect. <laughs> yeah, well, for both of you guys, I know that in going to various, you know, breweries myself, a lot of people will, they have the production facility and you just kind of drink it right with all the equipment mm -hmm. there. You guys did, I mean, I know Hoof Hearted has that. Is that, are you, are, are people sticking with that model or people moving away from it? Because obviously it's a different, you know, aesthetic. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, do you guys have a sense of, you know, is that still a popular thing to do? Because, you know, you guys are obviously with, you know, very designed, you know, facilities. That yeah. You're not, just, you're not just, you didn't just enter into the warehouse and here's right. all this stuff. And yeah, I think, I mean, you go to a lot of breweries and, and, and the, the sort of tap room, tasting room is very much in the same space as the brewing um, for us, it was uh, the way our building laid out. So our, our building is, a, is an old elevator factory that was built in 1920, and they added some office space to the front, and just the way it divided up. Uh, it made sense to sort of put the tap room in that old office space and then use the, the, the factory um, for production. Um, and since it's a building that was built in 1920, um, it's highly inefficient, so we didn't want to have to uh, condition, we didn't want to air condition or heat that back mm. space, because that probably would have bankrupted us pretty quickly. <laughs> um, so part of it was just, you know, the, the comfort level for the, you know, the, the patrons and all that, right. um, and, you know, just sort of practical reasons, yeah. just, just separate them. And yeah. Jared, I know your background, can, you know, so I have a couple slides here, so this sure. one is on the right. Branches on the left. Can you explain what are these big metal things like? Sure. What um, you know? And I'm sure why are they? I have no idea what any of that is. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, typically, so there's, there's usually two components, and breweries can be set up different ways. We use a two-vessel system, so we have a mash or a lauder ton, and then we've got our, our, our boil kettle. So mm. that's all the hot works side of things. And there's a couple different ways. What is mash? Uh, so mash would be um, the, the vessel that, that holds the grain, okay. that when, when it's actually extracting its sugar and all that stuff, that process, that's the vessel okay. that holds the fluid. Um, and then obviously the boil kettle is what you, you, we transfer over to to boil it. Um, they can be heated different ways. Some people use steam. We use direct fire. Um, so typically, you'll you'll notice that the tank is is a hot side of things because there's a, a big ventilation stack that comes off of it. Um, most everything else that's that's in the the brewery section would be the refrigerated tanks. So you've got <coughs> fermenters. Um, some people use bright, bright tanks. We, um, uh, we actually don't use a bright tank, or at least at, at our production facility. We will um, down at our brew pub, but um, those are the refrigerated tanks. So that's where the fermentation happens. That's where all the temperature control needs to come into play uh, to make sure that the beer is held at a specific temperature. Um, that really is about it. Most of the other things that you're gonna see, you'll see a lot of pumps, um, sometimes, um, a CIP system, that's the clean in place is what that stands for. So um, every one of the tanks uh, after we're done brewing needs to be cleaned thoroughly. So we have a mobile CIP system that we bring around to each one of the tanks to clean it independently. Um, yeah, that, that basically wraps, wraps up most of what you're gonna see um, without getting into the... So when it comes area. to ramping up production, do you guys ever find like, like where would you, you know, if you wanted to grow in some way you know how much how much stuff does it require like where are you sure. going to run out of you know can you reuse things like how do you how do you go about sort of growing things because i mean i know for yeah. this particular location you're brewing for consumption on site yeah in a production place okay right. we need more space and i guess walt maybe you could talk about this yeah if you're selling you know you guys are kind of how far can you go within your existing space? Do you yeah, so basically, start a satellite yeah, so thing? Basically, point? when you look at it, what determines your sort of capacity to brew is your fermentation space for the most part. Because um, if all your fermenters are full, you can't brew again until one's empty. Um, so basically, you look at it as how many fermenters can we fit in here. Um, we started with four 40-barrel uh, fermenters. We added a fifth for a 40 barrel 40 barrel fermenter and a uh, 20 barrel fermenter. And when I say barrel, um, like your classic keg, like from your college house party is a half barrel keg. Um, the brewer's barrel is uh, 31 gallons, so two of those half barrel kegs. Um, so out of a 40 barrel fermenter, you can get, in theory, 80 of those kegs. Um, and then we just added two uh, 80 barrel fermenters um, two weeks ago. Um, so we, we kind of had a plan um, of you know how we would expand within the space. Uh, we're almost full back there in, in a year. Didn't take long. We thought it was going to take a little longer than that to fill it up, but uh, you know the reality of it is these are big things, and you got to find places to put them. Um, and so you know once you f you fill that up, you, you start to look at you know how do you expand outside the walls. Um, you know you can move from you know some places that have outdoor fermenters. Um, we're going to put in a grain silo to give us some more room. Um, and then, our, and then your other major limiting factor, especially self-distributed brewery, is your, uh, your, your cold storage space. And, and so that's probably what we're looking at next, to um, how do we uh, maximize our cold storage for the finished beer. And as it is now, we'd probably have to you know, build some sort of satellite um, so storage or find existing storage and put in a cold So you're sort of limited in the number of types of beer as of now, or just the real overall volume? Um, I, yeah, so yeah, I mean the fermenters yeah, uh, affect both of those because um, you're going to have your core beers, like for us it's our IPA and our, our Kolsch um, that you're going to be brewing all the time. So two of those tanks, you know, straight, straight out are taken up by those beers and that, and so then you're limited on, uh, you know, your seasonals and your, your more limited release stuff because you don't want to fill up a tank with this, you know, seasonal special beer, and and then short your accounts on an IPA or something like that. So you try and be as strategic about it as you can, and, and maximize the space that you have. Um, 
but yeah, it's, I mean, the, the growth and everything, it, it's hard to predict and, um, you know, you run out of space quicker than you think you will. <laughs> well, are you guys have an open house today? Do people oh, yeah, it's open over there right now. Um, bar's open and uh, we, we do tours at three. We'll probably do a few tours today and tomorrow. Tim, as far as the aesthetics of, well, brew pubs in this case or breweries in general, you talk about, at least in the case of Hoof Hearted, obviously there's a separation. Can you maybe talk about the design of it? You know, obviously Hoof Hearted is a funny name. Did that matter at all in the design of the, the, you know, the space and the sort of branding and, you know, like what was that sort of relationship like? Because obviously they're, right. they're separate, but in the same area. Yes. So from a design standpoint, I think for, for Hoof Hearted, obviously has a very distinctive aesthetic <laughs> that is uh, very, very, a lot of fun, you know, just it is with the artist, with Tom Lester being the, the artist and to, to do all the branding for that. And, you know, when we, when, when we actually created the, the brewery and the restaurant side, you know, we want to actually um, kind of uh, contrast that, actually, to actually create something that is very, very simple, almost Scandinavian kind of modern aesthetic to, uh, to, to kind of contrast with with that very kind of flamboyant, um, you know, quality of the of branding for, of Who Found It. And so, um, so that's, that's kind of where we're going with that, to, to have something that's really simple and clean and something that you, you almost have never seen in Columbus. Um, and now the rendering that you see on the screen is, is not exactly what we're gonna be. I mean, it's, it's mostly the same, but we're, we are actually modifying some of the design as uh, construction goes. Oh yeah, so um, when is under construction? Right. Do but, we know when it main, might be? Right. When can people have Right, but the main feature, it? I think the main feature of the design uh, from the very beginning is really, most of the time, a lot of times a, a typical uh, brew pub uh, would have the brewery uh, you know, area, the brewing area kind of tucked to the side or at the back or on one end of the space, and then have the, the restaurant and the tap room and the pub on the other end of the, of the space. And from our standpoint, when we design restaurant, we, we normally don't like to do, I mean, personally, I don't like to design restaurant that has a big open space, like a big, you know, kind of uh, a cafeteria type of feel. Uh, we want to create a restaurant that actually have different areas. So you can, you, you feel like you can be in one area that is separate from the other area, even though everything is connected. So at the very early on, we have this very kind of, in some way, radical concept to, to do, to, to put the brewery right in the center in the middle of the space of the whole restaurant, that uh, that actually achieved two, uh, you know, two uh, objectives. One is to feature the brewery. Everyone walks in, they can see the brewery. They can walk around the brewery. If you have, if you have kids, they can run around the brewery. You know, like literally, you know, on all four <coughs> sides. And then, so you can see the brewery from anywhere in the restaurant. And then the second thing that we achieved is that we actually create a device that separate the space, so you can be in the front. Of the space, you can be on the in the other side, and they're all separate. But because the brewery itself is a glass box, so it's a completely enclosed by a glass uh, enclosure, so you can see through the brewery. You can you can see to the outside. So it's somewhat open, but it's separated. So so that's really kind of the, the key of the of the design, um, how we organize the, the space. Yeah. So well, I know you have a background in design, mm -hmm. and I guess are we, how involved were. What were the sort of things when it came to doing, you know, Landgrid has a very distinct aesthetic. You know, yeah. What were you guys drawing from with that, whether it comes to the design of the cans, maybe some of the signage, the, the space itself? Were you kind of looking at it like Hoof Harder, were there separate things, or are you thinking of it more as a unified... Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, you know, we very much wanted uh, the feel of the tap room to reflect the Landgrid brand as a whole. Um, which, and if you're not familiar, the name Land Grant comes from the Land Grant Act of 1862, which established colleges all across the country, including Ohio State here in Columbus. Um, and so we kind of draw our, our aesthetic inspiration from um, sort of classic collegiate artwork. Um, and so our, our tap room has kind of a, a, a sports bar-ish kind of feel to it. Um, but with all of that, we're not trying to hit anyone over the head with it. We know that sports aren't everyone's thing. Um, it's not everyone's cup of tea. So we want, we want to, you know, reference that stuff because, um, you know, it's obviously something we're into, but, you know, we don't want to beat anyone over the head with it. So, you know, we use a lot of just, you know, natural 
um, materials and, and exposed brick and, and, and all that stuff and some old vintage pennants, but, you know, we try and keep it, you know, tasteful and, um, you know, on brand for, mm -hmm. for land grant and all that. So, yeah, I think the space reflects the, 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 the brand and, and, the, and the beer names and, and it's all sort of, at least I think, pretty cohesive. Mm -hmm. So thinking about brewing in Columbus in general, you know, of part it has its own sort of aesthetic, you know, at least as far as the cans and then soon with the space, Langer has its own aesthetic. There's a bunch of other ones in town, you know, Zauber does a lot of German beers, Wolfsbridge has their own. Can you, he is talking about, you know, where do you kind of see the state of beer in Columbus right now? Are people going to, is there, is there such a thing as like a specialized brewery? Are people still sort of just aiming for quality? Like, what do you guys think the, is there any like, what are the beer trends in 2015 and Columbus. You know, I, I see it as still being pretty wide open. I mean, um, Columbus, I'd still say, is still kind of in its infancy when it mm -hmm. comes to the, the beer scene. Um, uh, I know it's a huge growth thing right now for Columbus. I, somebody told me not long ago that we're third or fourth in the, in the nation for growth, and, and then Cincinnati's, I think, even ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty, aggressive, um, pretty aggress aggressive business model right now. Uh, as far as beer styles, though, um, I think it's kind of nice that there are so many different offerings. You bring up somebody like Zalber, you know, that, that does focus a lot more on German-style beers. So, for different taste profiles, I know for us, we uh, we kind of set out to, to make the kind of beers that we like to drink. Um, and we felt like that was the best way for us to improve the beers we have to we have to actually enjoy. So there's, there's certain beer styles that, that, that I don't care for or don't seek out, so we've kind of almost avoided uh, making some of those. And I, I think that a lot of the breweries do somewhat of the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they kind of identify with certain style or series of styles um, that suits them, and, and that's kind of what they, they go after. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, and, and beer is such a, um, you know, a very, you know, thing that, you know, there's so many different styles, and, you know, you have a an imperial stout, and it's not going to taste anything like a pilsner. You know, it's it's such a, a wide um, you know variety of, of flavors and profiles and styles um, that I mean, there, you can really you can sort of give yourself a niche. I mean, you can do you know, there's breweries that do only barrel aged stuff or only sours or um, you know only IPAs or whatever it is. Um, so I I mean I I think you can you can sort of you know, if, if you wanted to, you could you can pick a style and go with that and be very successful. And do you think there's something about Columbus which is unique in that? Is it open ended? Do people kind of steer one direction? You know, West Coast style, like people kind of know that as like a thing. Is uh, there is Columbus a good place to be doing this? And that things are open ended. Think, you yeah, know? I mean, I I think for the most part, um, everyone is is fairly open ended here. Uh, I mean, there's a few that sort of have picked their their niche or their, their specialty. Um, but I, I think right now everyone's, you know, like you said, it, we're still a very young, you know, beer scene. I think people are, and breweries are still kind of feeling that out and, and figuring out what they do really well. And, um, and ultimately, I mean, the consumers are kind of make that decision for you. Right. You know, you can open a brewery and say, oh, we're going to make this beer and it's going to be our flagship. But, you know, if no one buys that one and they buy this one, then, right. you know, beer B is now your flagship because that's what people want and mm -hmm. they're going to sort of um, you know help you define that so. right so Tim thinking about you know the restaurant can you it's obviously there to sort of celebrate the beer but it's also a part of the sort of larger you know development where this song was it north was it fourth, fourth yeah. and second first for first Close. Uh, but also, you know, in, in a lot of ways, if you kind of look at that development, you know, Seventh Son, it's sort of a big attractor. You know, St. James is there for a long time, but they're really, it, in a lot of ways, you can say Seventh Son, and even now, you know, with Land Grant and Franklin, it's sort of spurring growth, it's bringing a lot of people there. Do you, and we'll see what happens with Puff Hardy, but it, is, this, is this a trend that I'm just kind of, you know, making up, or do you kind of see it in some ways where? You know, there's sort of a successful brew pub in some ways, bringing a lot of people to areas where they normally, you know, wouldn't go. Do you think that's 
Do you think that can keep going? Is it sort of an accident? Is it? Well, I, I would yeah. say here's the thing about the new brew pub that is I think is different than the whole kind of the whole neighborhood pub is that I think if you look at the demographic of Columbus or the, the development of Columbus, I mean, you know, if you look at how many young professionals that we're adding as a city every year, you know, I think there's a huge demand for this this type of um, venue where it is it's it's open, it's modern, you know, it's inviting. It's really built to attract uh, kind of a bigger community that is more friendly. It's not like your old corner neighborhood pub where it's, there's no you know there's no window and you have to know the right people to go there. You don't feel really comfortable. You haven't been there before. Um, so I think these type of uh, brew pub is it's just it's just uh, it's very attractive. I would say for for kind of from a, from an entertainment standpoint that when you're young professional, um, you know after work or you know. What not? You you would, you would feel comfortable. You can check out these ways. You know, you go to Seven Sun, you go to Land Grant. I mean, it's a very it's a very comfortable space. You know, like it, it it's uh it's, it can attract a wide variety of people. I mean, obviously, you know, young professional one thing, and then on the other hand, you know, you have this you know so called empty nester that that they are you know the kids gone and they now they have more time on their hand and they can actually you know go out at night and actually look for some new venue. So I I, I think from from that standpoint. You know, definitely, it's it's a good, it's a it's a nice trend to to, to have these venue that people can they feel like they, they feel like they go to a place that first of all is friendly, is comfortable, is is new, but on the other hand, also for brew pub, and it goes back to it also go to I would say to the uh, more kind of like this local food craft beer kind of uh, movement in the sense that people want to know where their food comes from, right? They want to know where the beer comes from. And so when they go to these places, they feel like they feel a connection to the beer that they're drinking. It's like, okay, I know that this is fresh because the brew is right behind, uh, and they they feel the connection, and it just it's just different. It's just it's a different experience altogether than you just go to a restaurant, you go to Applebee, and you order Bud Light. <laughs> I mean, um, it's just it's a very different. So I, I say it's it's definitely gonna have an impact. Yeah. So you mentioned something interesting, which is like the freshness of beer, like. Mm-hmm. Is that a thing? Like, I don't really, you know, is that something that you guys have talked about when it comes to designing the beer? Is that some, is that like a desirable thing? Is that something you guys can design in or out of? You know, like, what do you guys think when it comes to, you know, designing a beer? You know, how well, does I know, it go about? I know for us, you brought up like the, you know, West Coast, West Coast IPA. Um, um, and I know Land Grant um, has, a, has a good IPA and I think we have a, a good IPA too. Uh, one of the one of the key factors about IPA is drinking it fresh, mm-hmm. um, as fresh as you can get it, because it it gets worse over time. So yeah. uh, it is not a type of beer you want to sell her and hold on to and drink six months from now. Um, whereas maybe like a barrel aged may may fit that. So for us, since we were after a lot of hop forward beers, that was one of the very you know attractive things when we first got started. Um, there just there wasn't many offerings in Columbus. I think there is. Elevator, Barley's, um, and then in the same year that we started, uh, Zalber came on Four on String, four string yeah. and then shortly thereafter, yeah. Seven Sun. So, and, and now there's there's you know there's a ton. So, um, so I think freshness was a big big part of what we were after. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned some of the other breweries. I know they're in like I think for a time there was a people were kind of calling like Grandview like the new like. Mm-hmm. Or the brewery district, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, you guys are in, will be, you know, you're in Marengo, you will be in Italian Village, yeah. while you guys are in Franklinton. Mm-hmm. Franklin is not really known for beer production. Like, what <laughs> brought you guys here well, across the street? Uh, um, is there, like, are there so, good neighborhoods? Like, what's the, um, what's the thought process behind Well, that? I mean, you know, every neighborhood should have a brewery, um, but... You know, when we first started looking, you know, Franklinton was a was a neighborhood that we kept hearing from folks like go look at go look down in Franklinton. It's kind of up and coming area, some cool old buildings and stuff down there. Um, and when we f- did did our first initial search, um, we just couldn't find anything that that suited what exactly what we wanted to do um, with the big production space and the tap room. Um, the the physical location was always very appealing to us. Uh, being right over the river from downtown, um, a lot of creative energy and good stuff happening down here. Um, so we did actually have a building in Grandview that didn't work out. Um, 
and so we kind of reopened our search and, and we found the building um, that we're in now and um, for us you know our, our main thing is we always wanted to be close to the, the urban core and and be able to produce beer on a, on a large scale and um, you know, do you think those things ever come do you think they're you know you could imagine having a production space on high yeah. street might yeah might cost a little bit more than sure the, oh yeah i mean yeah and you know the the the, the that was a major uh, factor too to be able to kind of get in on the ground floor down here and um, you know in Columbus being sort of a, a, a newer city that doesn't necessarily have the um, the industrial history of like a Cleveland or Cincinnati or Pittsburgh um, the the stock of sort of old you know factories with great you know ceiling height and all that um, is low because most of the ones that we do have have already been turned into um, you know, lawyers' offices or uh, apartments or whatever else. Um, so, I mean, it, it was a long search to find a, a building like that. Um, you know, and luckily we found one here in Franklin. Then mm -hmm. that, that kind of hit all of our, you know, hit all the checks for us. So. Do you think that there are many more places? Like, where do you kind of see? Are there? You know, it seems like you're, you're kind of it's not easy picking. You know, early. Yeah. Day, but yeah, do you do you kind of see the growth trajectory brew pump sort of leveling out because obviously it seems like there's going to be more money required if people are filling up all the places that are a little bit less you know costly and yeah and i mean there's always turnover you can be in the right place at the right time and find find that you know perfect building that just became available for whatever reason mm -hmm. but uh yeah for us i mean the, the finding the building and the real estate search was absolutely mm -hmm. the hardest thing um, mm -hmm. and took definitely took the longest i mean that took us two years to right. just find the building right so, Jared, can I, can I add something yeah. to, to that too? Because I think there, there's always, when you look at brewery, there's always, there are actually kind of, I would say, two types of brewery. There's one that is startup brewery, you know, like Land Grant or even who called it, where they obviously, when they look for a facility, they want, they, you know, it's not like they have a ton of money, mm -hmm. you know, to, to pay whatever they want. And so they, 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 you always see this new brewery being kind of in those areas where you have some old warehouses that is available. But you're like Franklin at that time, three years ago, two years ago, I think it's the right time to do that. Now maybe it's a little bit harder when you come to Franklin, you know, today. Um, and and it, it might we might need to go to some other places. Whereas when you have a more established, you know, brewery, they would have more resource and more, you know, capital to pick and choose where they want to go. And we see that, you know, in Columbus there's some big brewery that's coming to town mm -hmm. that that is much, much bigger in yeah. scale, obviously. But so that's a, almost like an import. Yeah, do you guys think that in some ways the sort of recent resurgence of new brew pubs does have to do with the fact that there's sort of an existing building stock that can be filled in and with what, well, people like beer, maybe we'll do that, you know, because 20 years ago, it's not like everybody was, you know, doing this. Do you guys, yeah. is it just sort of a cultural thing? What do you guys think might be, you know, driving this? Because it seems to happen hand in hand, you know. Yeah. There's, what are we going to fill these buildings up with? Well, we need a lot of space for you know barrels. Right, right. Yeah, I, I would say there's definitely um, you know a component to that. Um, you know, we talked about Seven Sun, but um, if you look at their space, it used to be I think a, a tire shop, or mm -hmm. you know, garage. and and so they've taken the garage doors and, and turned it into something in it, you know, uh, that would have been an empty building and, and and probably more of an eyesore. Now it's a destination. Mm -hmm. So in that area, you know, we're going to be right down the street from them. Um, the Italian village, there's a lot of stuff going on, similar to kind of Franklinton, where there's just a lot of growth. Um, you know, oddly enough, downtown Columbus, and I've lived in Columbus my entire life, downtown Columbus has always been kind of a, there's just not a lot there. There's, there's big business there, and, but then it kind of dies after the, the days. Lots. You know, yeah, it's parking lots, and so uh, it doesn't really draw people, but now we've got at least things that are surrounding the city that, um, gives it for you know young professionals that want to be in and around the city but maybe don't want to necessarily be right downtown because there's just not much there mm -hmm. um, they can you know go to a happy hour right you know right across the river and um, and, and go about their you know their day so um, but I think I think to your point repurposing a lot of these buildings is a, is a thing financially that makes sense and then mm -hmm. also it kind of uh, um, resurges an area. Yeah, and I think also, I mean, to talk to your point of, you know, why are we seeing this now as opposed to, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and the reason you're seeing this boom of, you know, smaller breweries is, you know, the state of Ohio has made it a lot easier to get into, um, 
especially to be able to have you know a brewery and a tap or an on-premise tap room um whereas I, like five years ago you'd have to get a whole separate separate uh liquor license you'd have to have a restaurant you have to do all this um and then they passed some legislation that basically said if, if you're brewing beer you can serve it on premise as long as you've got like two up to code bathrooms and, and that's basically it okay. so the the you know, Ohio isn't necessarily the best state for beer laws, but it's certainly not the worst. Um, we've got it relatively easy here, um, and 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 that that change that they made uh, made so point of that, made that, point of entry a lot easier, especially if you're if you're looking to brew on a much smaller scale and just um, basically brew to you know feed your tap room. Uh, it makes that much more attainable. So is it, was there was there pent up demand for people wanting to do their own beer that it's sort of like. <laughs> okay, now we can finally do it because things have been, you know, a little bit more. I think so. Things are yeah. easier. Yeah. I, mean, well, I mean, you said five years ago, and I can think of. It might have uh, been a little more than five years ago, but give, it's give recent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it seems like, you know, most of the places that we've talked about are really. Fine. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. within the last. And some of know, it hasn't even been years. five years ago. They yeah. they changed the. Uh, it used to be uh, the license was a, was about four thousand dollars. So, the first two years that we were in business. Um, we, we spent $4,000 a year just to brew beer, which, it, like, like Walt said, on a small scale, it takes a lot to be able to recoup that. Mm -hmm. um, so now it's $1,000. So it's still not exactly cheap, um, but it's, it's a lot more affordable right. than, um, when you're just starting out. So, um, so talking about like the scale, Walt, I know you mentioned like nano breweries. Mm -hmm. Is that something that, you know, I was, when I was reading my, the, Encyclopedia of beer. They were talking about, you know, in a lot of basically historically, beer was sort of a cottage industry. It was kind of like, here's a cheese shop, here's a bakery, here's a brewery, mm -hmm. here's you know a restaurant. Do you kind of see? I'm just trying to think, you know, for let's say there's a restaurant, you know, I know what part is this production, which is to serve the restaurant, not necessarily to be distributed. Does it, if you want to do a restaurant, does it make sense to like have your own brewery and house? Does it, you know, what? Or if you want to do beer, does it make sense to sort of already, you know, have an introduction of food to sort of bring it along with? Like, is it something that we might see more of at a, maybe a smaller scale because it's just to sort of serve the, you know, let's say a restaurant nearby? Is that something that makes sense? Or is it just something that happens to be, you know, happening? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think breweries provide, you know, a draw in themselves. And I mean, so... Um, yeah, if you, I mean, if you can control that whole production process and, and put the beer out that you want that goes with your restaurant and everything, I think it's definitely but I a huge draw there. I also think that, you know, I mean, people who open brewery is like just beer fanatic in some way, you know what I mean? Like, like you have to be really in love with <laughs> beers and making beers. Yeah. So I, I don't think it's more like, oh, I, I'm going to open a restaurant, but by the way, why don't I just have a brewery? Yeah. It, it takes a lot to actually sure. do a successful yeah. and high quality you know, brewery mm. and beer. So it's, it's always something yeah. like, let's it, just add on. And that's the caveat here. I mean, it's, the beer has to be good. Yeah. You know, with all this stuff we're talking about, if the beer is no good, then it's not going to work regardless. So. Right. Well, I'm just trying to think, you know, Wolf's Ridge, for example, they start out, you know, they kind of get more press to the restaurant. It mm -hmm. turns out, like, you know, the beer is pretty good. Yeah. Is that something that, I mean, well, were you guys just thinking purely we're just going to do, you know, the brew pub and that'll sustain itself? Because obviously I think having food trucks nearby yeah doesn't help with and it's and it's yeah it's something that we you know we briefly considered putting a small kitchen in there um but we we didn't really explore it very far because you know columbus being such a great food truck town um it was very appealing to us to be able to bring in these other small businesses it's kind of a win-win situation for us we can you know keep things fresh have something diff different every night um and at the end of the day you know, we're not restaurateurs, we're not, you know, chefs. We wanted to make great beer, and so we decided to kind of focus on that and let, you know, these other folks that know food, you know, do the food, and we both benefit from one another, so. Mm -hmm. It was something we really didn't, um, you know, there was a brief time when we thought about it, but right. we kind of went with the food truck model pretty early on, so. Yeah. Tim, I know you've done a lot of restaurants, and this is one of the, I guess, is this the first that has beer? Production the as second a, one, I would say. With do the, you think the, that's something that people are going to want to do more of, or is this just really you have to find a sort of 
great relation. Yeah. You know, is it I mean, I would say it's, it's really the client has to be really into beer. For I think I think every time when you have a restaurant with a beer, with a brewery in it, I think the, the brewery normally comes first, um, and then the restaurant would be complementary to that to that establishment. You know, it's that's why at least from my experience, that's why I say it's like it's it's really because that I mean honestly, uh, it's not cheap to build a brewery. I mean, <laughs> no. I mean, it's. I mean, if you do have a brewery with all the equipment and everything, and then you have a restaurant with all the equipment and everything in it, it's like twice as much. I would say from a cost standpoint. So a lot of times you kind of have to pick <laughs> which one you really want right. to do. It's it's not easy to do a, a really nice restaurant and and with a really nice brewery in it. It's, I mean, from a con- you have to have a certain kind of economy of scale to actually make it work from from that standpoint. But you know, I mean, if but there's if there's demand, I'm sure that you know people would would, would like to do that. But I, I I think it's it's not necessarily like a, a trend that we'll necessarily see a lot more of that. I, I think we'll see some definitely. Um, but from my experience, I would say that the the beer people are probably gonna want to focus on beer mm-hmm. and really make really good beers, and then you know, and it just happened that if there's some really good synergy there, then they might have a food company. Mm-hmm. That's, that's how I see it. Yeah. So I know that you guys, you're obviously just sort of in it. Is that something that, you know, maybe Tim, you could talk about this. You know, how do people sort of reach out and say, like, okay, can we, how do we, you know, is that, do you think other people are going to want to bring other breweries in in the future? Like, does it make sense for me? You're obviously not going to lose money on it, but like, is it something where you think, Hopefully like, oh, you know, <laughs> oh, you know, let's hope not. Oh, hey, um, this is like a really great, Financial, like, is this like a new sort of business model to sort of partner with restaurants to then? Well, yeah. Um, it, it yeah, potentially. Though there are some, there's some hurdles. The 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 way that the law is written, you really, um, uh, it's a three tier system. So you have distributors, you have manufacturers, and then you have retail. Um, and uh, at least in Ohio right now, you can't have ownership in any two. You can be, only have one now. Groups that are our size, the, the law does permit us to self-distribute, um, but we can't. Like for instance, we couldn't come down to land grant and say, "Well, can we distribute your beer for you?" Right. Um, or, or vice versa. So um, there are some inherent challenges. Um, so restaurants can't just go out and say, "Well, I want to, I want to open a brewery in here as well." Um, by law, at least in Ohio, as it stands right now. Are there can't. other states where that's allowed? Um, I, I would just expect. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, all of uh, where where that's permitted, but um, you know, it is a state by state type of thing. So, um, at least in Ohio right now, and it, it goes back as far as um, uh, prohibition that this law has been in place this way, and mm-hmm. and so um, and there's just not been enough. Uh, there's not been enough demand that it's that it's changed. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So I know that you guys were production only. Does it? And then while you guys were leaning that, well, we'll do production, but we'll have a tap room. Does it sort of, I guess in some ways, it, what, I mean, you guys each have started your own separate paths, which I don't, I kind of want to ask which is easier, but I just want to like know that <laughs> the, the, kind of none of them are question. easy. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess in some ways, I mean, what do you guys think as far as being able to sort of, you know, at the end of the day, if there's a lot of other breweries in town, you really have to build the brand. You know, mm-hmm. what is... You know, in 2015, is there a way that sort of helps? You know, because obviously there's a lot of competition when it comes to beer. Do you yes. think that everybody can just sort of, you know, soak it up, or do you really have to sort of fight to? You know, I mean, be yeah, we and you know, I'm sure you get the same question all the time: is you know, oh, there's you know, 15 breweries in Columbus. How many more can it really, you know? Um, sustain 15 well I, uh, yeah <laughs> and it's probably more than that now but uh it's a lot yeah it's uh, I think there's 17 in like the greater Columbus area and uh and you know the question is, can we sustain that and I think Columbus is still so young and, and has a long way to go with its beer scene uh I think you know we can sustain a lot more than that um I think what you'll start to see is you know the people or the, the breweries that aren't sort of looking at the whole, you know, the whole picture with you know your 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 branding, you know, uh, obviously your beer, and, you know the the brewery experience and all that. I mean, every part of your business has to be on point, and you have to there has to be some differentiation from the crowd because 
while I think Columbus can have a lot more breweries, at some point, you no, know, you, you're not going to get by on we're a local brewery. You know that is only going to go so far because, yeah, right. yeah, you're local, but there's 16 others that can say the same thing. You know, what's your story? What's the story you're telling? How are you standing out on the shelf? How are you standing out behind a bar? You know, and then you know once someone picks up the, your cans off the shelf and takes them home and drinks them, you know, if the beer's no good, they're not going to go buy. They're not going to buy it again. Mm -hmm. And you know, selling six packs to someone once isn't going to keep you in business. Right. So, um, yeah, I think, I think just, you know, having everything, you know, locked in and at the highest quality possible is what's going to sort of, you know, separate. It's going to be a little bit of a survival of the fittest situation. Yeah. So you're saying like local beer, just kind of thinking about that, you know, at the end of the day, it's not like, the ingredients are local or are they like is there something about you know this region where you know i know you can get you know, belgian yeast that has like mm -hmm. one set of characteristics you know like how do you guys is the local just because it's made in columbus and it's going to be fresh or like how do you guys go about you know is there something kind of about the region that sort of makes certain styles more appealing or what's the some of the ingredients I, some of the hops we can get locally um though um we also get hops from, from all over the world. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why um, it's such a popular thing right now is you can really brew beer anywhere. Um, there's nothing that limits us. Um, you know, we get our grain, which primarily comes from the Midwest. Um, hops we get as far as New Zealand, Australia, um, a lot on the West Coast as well here. So, um, that, whereas maybe you know, 10, 15 years ago, that, that was a little bit harder to do. Now it's more of a, a global thing. I mean, we can, we can kind of pick and choose what we want uh, the beer to taste like. Like Belgian yeast would be another perfect example of um, what's something that's pretty popular right now. So, um, so the, the nice part is that you can, you can do all these different styles, you know, locally and, and serve, you know, serve to the local and, and they don't have to travel around the world to get that same experience. So this kind of local beer isn't really a thing, it's really the local well, brewery, it, or is that kind no, of... No, I mean, it's definitely a thing, and being able to get the freshest beer, especially when you're talking about IPAs, or, you know, those kind of beers, I mean, that, that has a huge impact on quality. Um, I, I just think it's more, uh, from a marketing standpoint, just saying that you're local will eventually wear off. It, it, you gotta be good and local. You know, it's, um, you know, you can only get by on that for so long until like, if you keep making bad beer, people yeah. aren't going to care where it's from. Like every They're restaurant just gonna stop drinking local, it. but not every restaurant right. survives. Right. Um, right. And exactly. then to kind of talk about what, you know, getting the hops and stuff, that's something that, um, you know, with the growth of, of craft beer, both in Columbus and Ohio and, and everywhere else, I think people are starting to see, you know, growing hops as a pretty viable you know, business for a farm, and we, there's, you know, three or four uh, farms in Ohio that I'm aware of that are sort of making a big investment to grow hops on a real, you know, a real scale, um, so that maybe we can and use more Ohio-grown hops. Uh, I mean, most of them are coming, you know, most American hops are coming from West Coast or Michigan right now, and so it'll be cool to get those in, and also be interesting to see how that um, you know, getting those hops grown in different places right. will affect the flavor. Because um, can you make an all Ohio beer right now? Is that or would you even want you, to? If, uh, you, you, know, you could. <laughs> I don't know if you could make that much. You, not on a probably production scale. Yeah. Because okay. a lot of the hop farms here are, are pretty young, um, and and it, it takes a few years to really get a get a full yield of hops. So it'll be interesting. You know, three to five years uh, when there's more available to see that coming and. And, and you'll start to get, you know, if someone's growing, you know, Cascade hops here in Ohio, those Cascade hops are going to taste different than Cascade hops grown in, you know, Oregon or wherever. And you'll get, it'll be interesting to get a little more of that regional flavor, mm -hmm. sort of like wine, you know, you grow, you know, uh, you know, Pinot grapes here. I'm not a wine person, but Pinot <laughs> grapes there. You know, you get a different, you know, that, that terroir, like that earthy, you know, it, it affects the flavor. So that'll be interesting to see mm -hmm. um, as it sort of matures. Yeah. Are there any other cities that you guys can think of that are, have kind of tracked where Columbus is as far as beer growth, beer development? Are they, you know, like, is the city like 10 years ahead of us because their legislation was different? Like, you guys, is there like a sort of, is there a model in the U.S. or 
not in the U.S. that Columbus is kind of you know falling into as far as you know. Uh, I, I would definitely say there's some cities out west that you know um, Colorado. There's there's you know there's breweries, um, and so they're I think they're quite a bit further ahead than us. But you know to kind of uh, uh, go to Walt's point, there is out there there's there's literally and I can't remember the exact exact statistic, but somewhere like in Oregon, there's like 20 breweries um, for every you know million people or something to that effect. Yeah. Um, so they sustain a lot of uh, local uh, breweries um, just by because that's what people want there mm -hmm. um, so I think Columbus is starting to get to that um, and uh, I think it's it's going to continue yeah I mean I think you look at cities like Portland and San Diego as sort of the shining examples of what you know what a beer city can be uh, I mean those are those are the two cities that are probably out in front of everyone else and you know they're not they're pretty similar in size to Columbus and you know yeah. you can at least you know population wise so I mean you can look at them and see the success that they've had and, and you know it's not unreasonable to think that Columbus could you know get to a uh, a volume of beer like you know like they're putting out so, mm -hmm. so what make them ahead of Columbus if they're the same size or same same scale uh, I mean they're in they're the west coast I mean I mean it's just availability to you know you hops and, and laws and yeah yeah, it's like, is it a yeah I mean San Diego is you, know, you can go sit on a patio 365 days a year so that yeah. probably helps, so. <laughs> it helps. Um, but uh, I mean I think you know the the craft beer industry started you know in California and just access to you know hops and ingredients and everything else and um, I'm sure laws played a big part in that and I can't say exactly why, but yeah. that's yeah. probably something to do with it. Well, I'm done here. I guess uh, there's beer, so we can go. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Thanks. 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 Thanks.